Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'd a'ila habbati fillah This is the last uh, lecture of the course Last dars and this is the fourth principle By Shaykh Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab Rahmatullahi alayhi And it's a very short principle and we'll try to keep it concise and short and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with tawfiq. The Shaykh said, Rahmatullah alayhi, he said, Al-Qaidat al-Rabi'ah, Ana al-Mushriki zamanina aghlad shirkin min al-awwaleen, lana al-awwaleen yushrikuna fi rakha'i wa yukhlisuna fi shadda. وَمُشْرِكُوا زَمَانِنَا شِرْكِهِمْ دَائِمَا فِي رَخَائِ وَشَدَّةِ وَدَلِيلْ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى فِإِذَا رَقِبُوا فِي فُلْقِ دَعَاءُ دَعَاءُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ فَلَمَّا نَجَاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِّ إِذْ هُمْ يُشْرِكُونَ تمت وصلى الله وسلم على محمد وعلى آله the Shaykh said, Rahmatullah he said the fourth principle. The pagans of our time are more polytheistic than the pagans of the Prophets, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his time. Due to the fact, due to the fact that the early pagans used to commit polytheistic worship during times of ease, but were sincere to Allah during times of difficulty. How are the pagans of our time commit polytheism during times of ease and hardship? The evidence for this is a statement of the Almighty, and when they embark upon a ship, they invoke Allah, making their faith pure for Him alone. But when he brings them to land safely, behold, they give a share of their worship to others. This principle illustrates the fact that both the pagans of this time and early pagans are considered disbelievers. Although the early pagans, during times of great hardship, worshipped Allah and recognized his lordship. Therefore, all those who disbelieve in Allah, His Messenger, and the religion will abide eternally in the fire. However, some will receive a punishment more severe than others in accordance with the level of their shirk and sinfulness. The pagans in the Arab Peninsula during the time of the Prophet and the time, uh, during the time of the writing of this treatise believed in the Prophet wasallam, the day of judgment, the angels, and they uttered the testimony of faith. They made the shahada. However, they violated Tawheed al-Ibadah because they sought blessings from trees, stones, and dead saints. Uh, these were their habitual practices. On the other hand, the early pagans rejected the Prophet wasallam and the Day of Judgment, but they did worship Allah by supplicating to Him during difficult times. That means during ease they uh, is when they were committing shirk, but when things were very difficult for them, then they would begin to uh, supplicate to Allah alone. The shirk of the latter-day pagans was worse than the early pagan Arabs. However, their disbelief varied. Uh, the four principles that Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab mentioned were standards in which to uh, distinguish polytheism from monotheism and pagans from monotheists. So that there would be no confusion or deception regarding the various practices and acts of worship they do. Some polytheists pray and claim love for the Prophet wasallam, perform the pilgrimage to Mecca and fast. However, they associate partners with Allah and seek intercession from other than Allah. Allah and worship various deities seeking to draw nearer to a law which does not benefit them. Finally, another matter pertaining to these principles is the issue of takfir, declaring a Muslim to be an apostate. 
Uh, takfir is a serious issue that is left to the scholars and Islamic judges to determine and apply a judgment upon an individual. Although a person may err and do an action or say a statement that nullifies his or her faith, it does not ne necessarily denote apostasy. There are conditions and issues which prohibit making the ruling of takfir upon a specific individual. And qualified scholars determine the judgment. So takfir, or declaring someone an innovator or sinner, are Islamic judgments. Therefore, its rulings are taken from Islamic law. And it is not for anyone to declare someone to be an apostate or sinner or innovator or to be misguided except with evidence. This was the statement of Sheikh Ab uh, Abdulaziz al Rajihi, one of our Mashaykh Ahl Sunnah in Riyadh. The accusation that someone is heretical or has committed an act of apostasy must be established by sound evidence as slander is punishable under Islamic law. The Prophet ﷺ said, abusing a Muslim is fasuq, meaning an act of disobedience, and killing him is an act of kufr, meaning disbelief. In another narration collected by Al-Bukhari and explained by Ibn Hajr, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever accuses a Muslim of disbelief, then it is if he has killed him. These narrations exemplify the seriousness of making takfir and that the one that does so carries an enormous responsibility and should be a scholar of the religion because declaring a Muslim to be a disbeliever by mistake is a major sin and both classical and contemporary scholars agree to this. Sheikh uh, Abdul Nasser uh, 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 Barak states, it is upon the Muslim to fear polytheism and ask his Lord to protect him from it in its various forms because polytheism overcame many of the creation from the early generations to those who will come last. The something very important which we didn't highlight but is contained in the treaties is the importance and of of course, keeping your ibadah strictly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prohibit, prohibited sallallahu alayhi wa sallam making the graves places of worship. And, it's, and, and first and foremost, the graves of the prophets alayhim afdal salatu wa salam. So then even more so, the common individuals or people who are considered awliya or saints to some of the people, that their graves are not to be venerated. And we should not strive to rush to go to the graves and so forth. فَنَاهَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم أَنْ امتحان المقابر بِجَعَلَهَا مُوَاتٍ لِقَدَى الْحَاجَةِ وَأَنْ وَتْئِ الْقَبُورِ وجلوس عليها وأن كسر عظام الميت وحذر العلماء المسلمين وفقهاؤهم من نبش القبور لغير مصلحة تعود للميت أو ضرورة. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم gave the the uh, Islam gives the the deceased uh, certain rights and that we should not. Uh, have relationships on the graves. We should not sit on the graves. And that it is not a place, it's a, it's a place that has sanctity, that you should not uh, use the restroom on people's graves as well. And you should not break the bones of the deceased. And the ulama and the fuqaha also uh, warned against this and that there's a certain mannerisms for the graves. The fact that graves are respected and also righteous people are respected does not mean these things should be taken to the, to the, uh, uh, to the level of worship. And the Prophet wasallam, when he was near death, he wasallam, warned against the act of taking uh, the graves uh, as places of worship. This was on the, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on his deathbed. On Abi Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu qal, qala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, qatala Allah al-Yahud, ittakhudu uh, kubur l-anbiya'ihim masajid. 
Mutafakun alayhi in this hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that may Allah curse the Jews, they took their, the graves of their prophets as, as mosque or masajid, meaning places of worship. And some of the fawaid that we gain from this hadith from uh, Shaykh Sa'ad uh, bin Nasir al-Shatri, Hafidullah Ta'ala, he mentioned in his explanation of Bulugh al-Maram, which is very, very beneficial. He said the first benefit we gain from this hadith is the prohibition of making the graves of prophets as masajid. And that it is one of the major sins. And likewise, or in addition to this, or included in this prohibition, is other than them, like the saints, the awliya, and, and, and other than them. That regardless of whether the people uh, build, or uh, regardless of the, uh, whether the people make uh, buildings, or make a masjid, uh, on the grave in order to seek blessings from it or in order to venerate it or to bring them closer to Allah as a means to bring them closer, closer to Allah or other than this this hadith shows it's general and it includes a prohibition for all of those things all of those things meaning you cannot take the graves as places of worship you cannot build places of worship on the graves. And likewise, the graves should not be in Masajid. As some Masajid were built and then they put graves in there. You'll find some of these in Hadramaut. You'll find them in, in many of the Muslim countries, but especially places also like in, in parts of Yemen. And you'll find this also in Egypt and other places. Another benefit he mentioned... And this was also narrated in Sahih Muslim uh, in another narration. يَأْتَخِذُونَ كُبُولُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِهِمْ وَصَالِحِيهِمْ مَسَاجِدٍ That the Prophet وسلم, said is that they took the graves of their prophets and their righteous people as masajid, as places of worship. So this lets us know the Jews were cursed. And in another narration, the Jews and the Christians were cursed for this. For this very reason, the Prophet ﷺ said this on his deathbed, letting us know that this hukum is still a, 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 um, a relevant hukum, that it hasn't been abrogated. This was in the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And it also shows us how serious of a, of, of a sin it is because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned it on his deathbed, you know, when he was, he was near death. And that taking the graves of the prophets alayhim after salatu as uh, is prohibited and likewise as is in this nas in this text that they're the the saints as well that we cannot uh, say so and so was a righteous man and we're going to make his grave a place of worship we're going to sacrifice to his grave we're going to pray on his grave we're going to build a masjid a masjid on his grave and all these things all of these are prohibited and they are all uh you know, wasail and means of shirk, means of, uh, of, of polytheism. Also, that uh, the Shaykh mentioned, the point we already mentioned, that it's not permissible to, uh, for a Muslim to be buried in a, in, a mas in a masjid. Another benefit he mentioned, he said, Adam uh, sihat salat he said also that it is that a person's prayer is not accepted if they prayed in a masjid that was built upon a grave. So those masjid that have have a grave in them, or the the, the masjid was built upon graves or a grave, then the the masjid, the, the prayer in it is is not accepted. Another benefit he mentioned is also that it is an obligation to destroy those masajid, those masajid that have graves in them, or that uh, or that were built upon the ones that were built upon graves should be removed. 
They should not be misogyn. And the ones that have a grave in them, you can remove the grave. The grave can be taken out. Uh, and related to this as a type of, uh, which, is, which is very important, is the point of uh, the ulama, they speak about the grave of the Prophet that this, uh, that is not considered where the Prophet is, is buried, a part of the masjid, because the Prophet was buried in the house of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And then the masjid in later generations uh, was expanded. It kept expanding and expanded on that side to where it expanded around the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ's grave is walled in and sealed. So the ulama, they say that that is not actually a part because you have no access to that. That is not a part of the masjid itself. The masjid uh, is built around it. Nor can you pray in the direction necessarily of the grave because the walls that are inside the place where the Prophet ﷺ is built, which was initially the house, originally the house of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, those walls have, uh, you know, are in, uh, they're not in like a square shape or a, a shape like that, but instead they're uh, at various angles, so that way you cannot uh, know and, and pray in the direction and pray towards the grave. Pray to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ, pray, uh, you know, in, in that direction. So they consider that hukum that it is, some of the ulama say that this was an exception because of what it was built. And then there are some very rare, rare views of some of the ulama over time who've said that they, uh, that the masjid should not even, uh, you know, that not that the Prophet ﷺ's grave should be removed, but the, the masjid should not extend at all around that. But since that is the case, it was already the case, and now it's been that way for a thousand plus years, then this is how the ulama of Islam dealt with this, uh, this issue and so forth. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jal. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan. And uh, we finished... Quiet al Arba, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with tawfiq and bless it to be a benefit. I hope it was a benefit to those who listened, and I benefited myself in going back over this book and looking in some, in some of the books of the scholars in order to review and try to prepare for this as best as I could in such a short period of time. And allow me two weeks or so to gather the names up. And if anybody who is also finishing it within the next week, they listen to this, they can also add their name to the list and I will and send it to me by email. And I will also give them uh, a certificate as well. So anyone who responds to me within the next week with their name and so forth and, and that they're listening to them and, and, go, and planning on finishing it or they have finished the series, then do so and I will give you a certificate. So allow me two weeks because I'm going to be traveling and I need this time and, and I will be very busy and I ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.